Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest edition of the Jake's Take with Jacob Elisha podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Elisha, the chief content producer and writer of jakesake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. If you're watching this video on your YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and please subscribe to my channel. Now, if you're listening to this on any of our audio platforms, download this episode and additional episodes, and please give us a five-star rating. I really appreciate it. I am so honored and thrilled to welcome this artist today. As of this recording, he has over 2.9 million followers on Instagram, and his YouTube channel has been has over 2.68 million subscribers, and all of his videos combined, you can find all of them. As of this recording, 281 million views. And right now, his exhibit, Dumb Dreams and Messy Hands, can be seen at a K-11 Shanghai Art Museum in Shanghai, China, until October 7th. So please help me welcome Danny Castle to the podcast. Good to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Jacob. Danny, this is probably one of my biggest guests I've had this year. So you are very honored to that you took time to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. No, hey, my pleasure. My pleasure. I mean, it's, it's an honor and an, a privilege. And uh, I think this is the first conversation that I'm having, at least here in America, about the uh, the show over in Shanghai. So, uh, you know, we're, we're doing it right here with your show. I'm very honored that you selected the Jake's Take with Jacob L.A. Share podcast as their platform to be the first American-based podcast to talk with you about this incredible exhibit. We'll get to that exhibit in the future, but first... Let's talk about origin stories. So when we get interested in cartoons and how did that passion evolve into desire to pursue career in media and art? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, in, in a way I've always doodled. I've always doodled throughout class growing up, you know, uh, as early as I can remember kindergarten. I was always drawing and, you know, asking the teacher to hang it up by their desk. But, uh, you know, it really persisted through the years middle school high school college and um i've been out of college for five years or so now but the the main thing with drawing and doodling is it it was my uh social currency in a way you know that's what i was good at that's kind of all i did you know my classmates would look over and see me drawing and sketching on my my spanish notes and they'd be like oh that's kind of weird or that's kind of cool or whatever and it also just kept me awake. You know, I wasn't uh, the most enthusiastic with school. I didn't have the best grades. I tried my best, but, you know, drawing and doodling during class and even on my homework just kind of kept me awake and kept me going. And, um, you know, I'm very thankful that uh, they kept me from, from falling asleep in class and also ended up making me some friends at the end of the day because I would draw comics. I would draw funny scenarios. I feel like, there were even some of like the early memes, you know, so uh, uh, it really kind of quickly became a part of my personality, I would say. Absolutely, because here's the thing. I draw a, drew a lot when growing up. However, I was so stunned by religious school because the thing is I drew a drawing of like a Miss Frizzle or Mrs. Jeepers, you know, from Bailey's Schoolhouse while yeah. I was supposed to be learning about a Jewish education and everything, and I got sent to the principal's office. Oh, yeah. You know, that's probably happened a time or two to me. I uh, it, I, I, I consider that to be just, um, you know, one of the one of the occasional consequences of, of being an artist at that age. You got to uh, sometimes face the music, you know, when you draw on a wall like I did plenty of times or I drew on uh, the radiator next to me in chemistry class a ton. Uh, I even drew on the school lunch trays a few times and I would just like find it funny to see them go into circulation and see which who who got which uh, tray that I doodled on. Definitely got in trouble a few times. So, I, I mean, if you're trying to play it safe, I, don't, I, I you know, I wouldn't recommend doing that. I totally agree because here's the thing. I think I transferred over from artistry to writing and all my listing with stories. Like there's so much stories, but however... I go on and on about them. However, it must have been very interesting about going from like continuing to grow and build on these build overall on these on his artwork. So yeah, I gotta give you kudos from like because I dropped it as soon as I got in trouble, but you kept on going, my friend. No, I, I appreciate it. I uh well you found your passion. You found your passion with which is uh podcasting. And uh but you know, I think um uh every everybody has to experiment a little bit as to 
what their passion truly is. And I think I got very lucky where uh, mine was storytelling. You know, it was telling stories in in my doodles. It was telling stories um, in my the little home movies that I would make growing up. But uh, obviously, when you're you know in school and you're in class, you can't there's you can't express yourself uh you know and all you have is a pen or a pencil and some paper and i you know chose to express myself with those things and uh that manifested itself as as doodles and if you were to tell me that i'd be doing this now professionally uh i wouldn't believe you i mean of course it was always the dream but i how the hell do you become an artist i mean there's no i mean it's like so arbitrary so um, it, I'm glad it all worked out, but, uh, it was definitely against all odds. And that's amazing. And I got, and the thing is with the artists that I think about, my mind immediately gravitate, gravitates toward the out to the comic book artists that I adore, the Jim Lee's, the Alex Ross's, the Phil Jimenez's, the, e Mark, the Ethan Van Scribers, all the incredible, all the, all the Jeff, Tim Sale and Bruce Tim. All those incredible people that cr helped create and part of my art, part of the artwork and everything. So it's been, and even the late Neil Adams, I can't forget it, but Cameron Owen recently departed, John Romita Sr. So those were all of them were did incredible artwork. Yeah, yeah. And all, the, all those folks you mentioned, I mean, they have a profound impact on you and your personal life. You know, you think about even all the uh, artists behind the, you know, cartoons you watched growing up or, um, you know, really, you don't think of, a lot of people don't stop to consider how how much art and cartoons affect one's life, especially in the past few decades. You know, you have fictional characters, um, you know, like superheroes who maybe necessarily aren't real, but they have a very real and profound impact on your life, um, even though they're fictional. Uh, it doesn't matter. Right. And so. I, in, in, I, I always saw artists as being the closest thing to like magicians and uh, making you feel some sort of magic. So um, the fact that I guess I'm considered to be one of those magicians is uh, is pretty wild. It's incredible. So who were some of your artists that you admired growing up? Growing up when I was in my early teens, um, I well, of course, let me backtrack. You know, I, I always loved what uh what folks like Walt Disney built over, you know, generations. Uh, but even Jim Henson, um, you know, with the Muppets, you know, again, like making these very, very, you know, goofy fictional characters who are made out of, you know, uh, felt and, and stuffing. And, uh, you know, if it's Walt Disney, it's obviously, you know, pen to paper, um, physical animation, but these characters are not real. They don't exist but they feel as if they do. And it doesn't even matter that they don't exist because they have uh, such a real presence in everybody's life. I mean, you know, not even just child, like child's lives. Like, you know, you have entire families going to Disneyland still today and you have entire families going to watch the latest Muppets movie today. And, and you even have Sesame Street who like act as real foundational sort of, um, you know, teachers to children as they grow up and children of course turn into adults so like there's a lot of people out there who were raised in a way by these fictional characters um and and got taught lessons and values and um how to stay safe and and so that was always very of course i didn't realize it as i was growing up but in hindsight you know uh, very uh again magical to me and uh, as I got into my, you know, early teens, say 14 years old, um, I really became fans of uh, these animated shows called Adventure Time and regular show on Cartoon Network. Um, Adventure Time was by a gentleman by the name of uh, Pendleton Ward. And just seeing these like, you know, adults um, bring their wacky, goofy imaginations to life and having those shows become go on to be very successful hits. Um, always hugely inspiring to me. And, you know, uh, I, the goal was always to have my characters someday become as, you know, well-known um, and inspiring as, as those types of characters. It was always just very, very motivating to see, you know, adults doing it for a living. Uh, and, and what is it that they're doing for a living? They're just being goofy and imaginative. And 
uh, you know, kind of just thinking larger than life and everyday reality, really just, you know, making funny stuff up and uh, ideally making it making it touch, you know, millions and millions of people. Absolutely. And, and I'm so glad you mentioned Walt Disney and Jim Henson. Both of them have masterminded some of the best characters and delivered some of the best characters of all time. Everyone is synonymous with Mickey and Minnie and Donald and Daisy mm -hmm. and Goofy, along with Kermit and Peggy and Fozzie and Gonzo and Animal. So what goes through your mind when you create a character? When I create a character, um, you know, my, my, my main character uh, today is a character by the name of Spesh. And uh, Spesh is short for special, uh, as his motto is, you're special, which has come to be a bit of the you know, my personal motto. Um, but the, when I first created Spesh, it was very happenstance. This is, you know, back in 2017, uh, when I sort of first started my animation journey and I was just trying to sketch, you know, a funny kind of creepy off putting character. You didn't know whether you wanted to love him or, you know, feel off put by him. And, uh, what came of it was like this very, you know, doodly, like cat like blobby character. And it was telling you how you're special and, and you know, how if a murderer came up and tried to kill you, he, the, he would tell the murderer to not do that. That's how special I think you are. Very strange, you know, classic like meme type on, on uh, say, Facebook or Instagram. And that went very viral. But, you know, I never would have thought that 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 character would have you know gone on to become my main character you know the saying you're special became very very popular and very synonymous with my brand and uh of course you know the visuals with that character changed over time it, you know special got more plump more chubby more cute more fluffy uh obviously more refined um as we started like figuring out collectively as as the world like who special really is and so with that one, like, you know, I just sketched, I just put pen to paper and I, you know, didn't know what, what was going to come out or what would come of it. But uh, very naturally, very organically, my main character, my poster child character came to life. Um, and, you know, that came together over the course of a few years and as did a few other characters, you know, it, that I sketched like, you know, in a similar manner. But you know, nowadays when I'm doodling or sketching or writing in my journal or, you know, graffitiing on a on a mural wall or whatever, um, I'm, I still am never quite sure what's going to come out. Um, and that's how it's always been with me. I never really had too much of a plan in my in my brain. I kind of just always went for it and saw what happened. And I think that's the that's the allure of my work. It's very. Um, you know, it has that doodly feel because I'm kind of truly making it up as I go. Uh, so to answer your question, I don't really know what's going on through my head when I come up with a character, except, uh, you know, maybe how I'm feeling that in that exact moment, maybe how, uh, you know, uh, I, I, like a vibe that I want to go for. Do I want to go for cute or cuddly? Do I want to go for, you know, a, a, a bigger character, smaller character? Do I want to go for something more creepy and weird or you know, all those definitely play an effect, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess the, the goal when I, when I do sketch is to just have fun and see what happens, you know, kind of just go for it. Absolutely. That's what I love about character making and everything. So I want to talk to you about some of the, one of your, one of the major things that a lot of my audience might recognize you from is from your YouTube videos. And I picked out a couple of them to talk about you. And one video that I was watching was before we had our conversation was your most power, probably your most vulnerable and your most personal. It was surviving the worst year of my life. And as of right now, this recording has over 27,000. So I want to applaud you for being brave and for showing pacing. That's been a, that you had a rough 2022. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was definitely the most uh, honest thing I've ever put out there. And uh, I, you know, of course, had a, uh, my own rough year as many others have, you know, whether it was 2022, 2021, 2020 was rough for a lot of folks. Um, but 2022 was, of course, that 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 was my year um, for, you know, hitting my my own personal struggles. And um, that was the first time that kind of happened to me um, to that 
you know, sort of point where I felt like obviously I had to work through it first. But once I did come out the other end, I felt the need to talk about it um, because I feel it, you know, if you go through something like that, it's only as good as how much you want to share it and share your experience with others to help others. Um, so rather than kind of bottle it up and act like it never happened, um, I wanted to talk about it publicly, you know, to my audience and anytime that I am that honest and vulnerable to my audience, it tends to always be received very well, uh, which I'm very fortunate for. Um, but it's never happened to that degree. I mean, in the, in, in previous years, I would, talk about very personal stuff but i would talk about it you know through my animated characters and and you know they would be received very well and it's very powerful you know to be coming from such a real place but i would say that was the first time that uh, uh it came from me you know not one of my characters and you got to see uh uh you know how the you know human behind all these animations has been doing and um I, i'm very blessed that you know that was received well and i hope that it uh, helps others, whether you're an artist or whatever, you know, like whether regardless of, of what you're doing with your life and what you're going through, I hope that, uh, you know, people seeing that someone like myself, is, you know, has struggled in the past, um, you know, and, and how I worked to get through it. Maybe that could help others out there. That's all I could hope for. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also, guys, if you need any help, if you're listening to this right away, 988 very important number nine eight eight. Yep. So yep. you got to plug that in because absolutely we're, we're all having our own struggles. And I think that if you can't have thought therapy nine, and if you're worried about talking to your friends and family about it, nine eight eight is the perfect way to talk. Absolutely. Good plug. That's a good plug. And I, I feel like, you know, it's, it's not, it, it definitely hasn't been talked about enough in years past, but I feel like it is being talked about more um and resources are being put out there more especially during uh especially after 2020 so uh progress is being made which is which is good more people are talking about it absolutely so i want to make them move this on to a lighter conversation go back to the light to the lighter side so let's talk about some one of my things i talked about three that immediately gravitated for towards when your crush texts text you that with 3.4 youtube falls i'm like Wow, that's incredible. That's like the best way. That should have been the way to end how I met your mother. Yeah, that was uh that was a fun one. That was a few years ago. I collaborated on that with uh another very talented uh animator uh by the name of Weird Helga. And we just came up with this funny skit, you know. I feel like we all go through it at some point in our lives where someone you really like texts you and you're freaking out and you don't know how to respond. So um that was a that was that was a fun you know one especially stylistically because uh, I matched you know my sort of blobby style with her more detailed style and uh, people you know people loved it like you said something like over three million people watched it which is insane. Absolutely, absolutely. In addition to that, um, I could not get over that Eric and dinosaur and AirPods not for mm. poor people. <laughs> yeah that was uh that's one of my personal favorites uh the title is insane uh i think i made that in 20 early 2019 so like the airpods uh were pretty new at the time and i uh you know was just improving these lines and i was i guess 22 at the time um, just improving these lines in my little Brooklyn apartment, just like, you know, and, and what, what ended up happening was a skit manifested itself of a brontosaurus with AirPods pretending like he's better than everybody else. Um, and, uh, it just like hit so well. It resonated with so many people. People love the goofiness. People love the narrative of like this cocky brontosaurus and like you know someone really trying to inquire as to like why or why are uh these little tic tacs in your ears so mate why like why do they make you so cool like what's the secret uh that was a fun one you know i'm like perfect example of me just making silly you know voices into a microphone and uh somehow people like listening to it which is incredible 
And that's, I think, a lot of times, a lot of people go back to low stuff because I'm from Kansas, but I did spend some time in New York, especially during lockdown, from shutdown to phase four of yeah. 2020. So I've been there. I was there from June 2017 to May 2021. And believe me, there are some times I thought that I'm like, that I was that little t- I was that little person, and I was talking <laughs> to numerous product sources. <laughs> oh my god see that's the beautiful thing is you either relate to the brontosaurus or you relate relate to the little guy like questioning the brontosaurus and then in the end not to spoil it the little guy becomes the brontosaurus uh once he gets his own AirPods. so uh that was a fun one that was a really fun one another fun one i gotta say because it was a mixed media is i'm a cut 25 yeah. million views yeah i think that's my most viewed video still um and uh, all these videos are the ones, you know, playing on loop on these big, beautiful screens in Shanghai, which was uh, also fun to see them come so far. But the the yeah, the I'm a cup video, that one I filmed because I was bored in a hotel room and uh, I had my camera with me. I said, you know, I'm looking at these cups. I'm like imagining them arguing about, you know, who is a, the better cup and. I, again, like another improv sesh that uh, makes no sense, but it was so well received. Twenty five million views later, uh, it, it, and it's so quotable too. I mean, it's just one minute of two cups saying, "No, I'm a cup," and they're both cups. Um, you know, it's kind of and, and you know, you wonder like what the analogies are that could be applied to life. But again, me just being stupid in a hotel room. Uh, and it brought people a lot of joy, which is pretty awesome. And it could be the same thing with analytics between back with New York from like someone from Brook, Staten Island versus <laughs> someone that lives on Upper East Side. <laughs> That's a good one. I haven't heard that analogy yet, but that is that that is perfect. That is perfect. And and I think like what I, what I was trying to get at is, you know, I I, I was always a firm believer that you know uh, humans are generally very similar, and we should all get along and get past our differences. Um, and, and we should all, uh, you know, realize that we're kind of the same. Right. Um, and so these two cups, like one's a glass and the other is like a, uh, uh, more so paper, like cups a that paper you cup. in the bathroom. Yeah. Or like in a hotel where I was. And so, you know, it's like, of course they're like made of different material and they have different purposes, but they're both cups. Come on. Let's not argue over the nuances. They're both cups. Absolutely, absolutely. I want before we get talk about the exhibit because a lot of your artwork is under the name the phrase "Cool Man Coffee Dan." So how did that happen? Cool Man was a um, it was just a combination of words that I was messing around with on Twitter actually, which is is funny given the most recent current events around Twitter completely I'm rebranding. I'm not a huge fan of X. I'm not a huge fan of X. X. It's so wild. Like, so I guess end of an era, uh, mm-hmm. RIP, but uh, we do have Twitter to thank for um, my, my, my pseudonym, which uh, is cool man, coffee, Dan. And this all started when uh, I, I first learned about uh, Photoshop in 11th grade. I was a junior in high school. It was Halloween time, and I photoshopped a skeleton face on my face. I made it my Twitter profile picture, and I changed my name to Cool Man Skeleton Dan, just because I thought it was funny. And I was like, sweet. And then the following week, I changed my uh, profile picture to a picture of me drinking a mug of coffee, and I uh, changed my name to Cool Man Coffee Dan. And and I said, oh, this is fun. Every week I'll change my profile picture to a thing. And every week I'll change the name along with it. Cool man, blank Dan. The only problem is I just got lazy and I never changed it again. And I immediately fell out of that thing. So uh, it forever became cool man, coffee Dan. And then people started calling me that around town. And as anybody knows, it's tough to find a name or a nickname that sticks and so I accidentally found that nickname that stuck. Uh, and I was like, all right, I guess I'm cool, man. Coffee Dan. So, you know, it's, some people call me uh, just coffee, Dan. Some people call me cool coffee, Dan. Someone call me cool man, Dan. There's many variations, but uh, in short, I go by cool man. And uh, that's the you know signature on all my art pieces, for example. Awesome, Danny. Awesome. So let's talk about this exhibit. 
So yeah. your exhibit, Dumb Dreams and Messy Hands, as we said earlier in the interview, is at K-11 Shanghai Art Museum in Shanghai, China. So why was this location the perfect place to host your art? So Shanghai is an incredibly lively city. Um, and now that, you know, everybody is sort of over the whole COVID chapter and everything's open back up again, thank God, um, you know, the city of uh, Shanghai is back in full swing and it's opened its borders again and is allowing folks to come in and travel, um, which uh, in part is what made the uh, exhibition take so long to actually happen. Uh, it was in production for a few years um, in partnership with uh, the V Collective Agency, who uh, I worked with out there to bring this to life. But uh, for years, this was put on hold because of the, the COVID situation and the, and the restrictions out in China specifically. So it wasn't until this year, 2023, where it was able to finally happen. And um, so it is a few years in the making. Um, and it made, you know, opening night all all the more righteous because uh, I was like, wow, it's finally happening. I can't believe it. We're finally here. Uh, it had the largest opening night in uh, K-11 mall history as the way it was explained to me by the K-11 team, which is absolutely insane. I definitely couldn't have imagined that. But um, yeah, it's, it's really introducing me and my artist story to China. Um, and there's obviously a lot of folks that know about me and my work in the, in the Western territory of the world, but, uh, in a very incredible way in the past year or two, my works have just been starting to get discovered in China. Um, they've been, uh, sort of re-uploaded officially through my official China channels, um, and translated. Um, and so it's allowing, you know, millions of new folks in that territory of the world who don't have access to, you know, YouTube, who don't have access to Instagram, uh, they're now able to watch my animations fully translated to their native tongue and enjoy them. And uh, of course, people start going down rabbit holes of my huge catalog of animations. So uh, with all that sort of snowballing, and uh, this show finally being able to open up, um, there's wild uh traction happening with my work in china right now which is awesome because i mean you know asia in general really loves cartoon characters um especially cute ones and that's what i've been doing you know my whole career so uh it's kind of wild to see just the intense love and um enthusiasm for you know what i've been building for a few years um and just even like my my little drawings and my i did some live stuff on like mural walls out there and the love is just through the roof so uh uh it, it was it was a beautiful experience and i got to meet a ton of fans out there that uh obviously probably were never expecting me to come over there so a uh, huge hit um super immersive and experiential you get to true like meet my characters in real life huge beautiful vinyl sculptures of my character Spesh, a big fluffy sculpture of my character blue dude uh for the first time you get to see some of my earliest sketches that we were talking about at the start of this conversation uh two of my earliest sketchbooks from like 2014 through 2016 are actually on display um at this exhibit and um you know so far it's been up for uh, a little under a month, you know, three weeks or so. And every day I'm being tagged in photos and videos of, of people walking through the experience and enjoying themselves, you know, young and old, all different ages. Um, and so it, it feels like my own little personal Disneyland that uh, uh, is, is at that location through October 6th, 6th. Who knows? You might have, who knows? You might have Spash and Pikachu on one of these things, or Spash and Mickey. That would that would that would be a dream. That would definitely be a dream, you know. And I love both those guys, so uh, it would be that would be a dream come true for sure. Absolutely. So, what went in through like went through your mind when like playing the exhibit? Because, like you said, you had over almost a decade of artwork to showcase on this on this. So, what were like what were some of the most important pieces? That your that the uh K what K eleven Shanghai audience want that wanted you to want to see from you. Yeah, so 
I think there was like, you know, a few different mediums. There was obviously, you know, the sketchbooks, early sketches that I, I have in the vault that they wanted to have on display, which I thought was a great idea. Uh, and then there was, you know, the, the vinyl sculptures that, um, you know, bring my characters into reality in a fun way. But um, so much of my work is digital, of course. So we partnered with uh, Hisense, which had these have these beautiful screens to um, I think it was like 40 or 50 screens that show my animations on on loop for three months. Um, and we obviously wanted to do that in a way where it looked beautiful and felt as if, you know, when you're watching one of these, you're stepping into one of my animations. But um, to sort of walk through my my own show and have, you know, 40, 50 of my animations be playing at the same time. I mean, it's insane uh, to see the amount of work that I've made over the years. You don't, you know, really think about it. But when you look back and you see them all playing at the same time, ready to be, you know, enjoyed and um, and they're all translated, of course, into Chinese. But um, it's 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 wild. It's really, really wild. So, you know, to have it be on display, especially at K11, which is just a massive, massive uh, staple in uh, Chinese culture and they respect arts, the arts and the artists so, so much, um, to have all my animations on display at K11 is, uh, is a really wild, you know, thing to accomplish, uh, that I never would have thought at least would have happened this early. So the fact that it's happening now is, uh, very personally inspiring because that means, uh, you know, I get to create the next decade of animations and see where we go from there. Um, but even if it's able to, uh, appeal to new people that never saw my work before and, you know, really like speaks to them and, and turns them into a fan, um, that's the exciting part to me. You know, you could just kind of walk in not knowing anything about me and really enjoy your experience and, um, enjoy the animations and enjoy what the characters have to say. That's, that's the magical feeling about all this. And that and that's incredible because I heard that it was that the launch had over one thousand seven hundred VIP guests, which is like for me since I go I'm in the Comic Con world. That's just inc that's just like incredible. That's, yeah, it's like a re I heard it was like a record breaking or some audience or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, it broke it broke the record, which uh, you know, like afterwards at dinner, I was like sitting with the k11 team and they're like yeah today went like really well and i was like oh amazing I, i'm so happy to hear that i had uh I, you know I, it felt like it went well to me but i don't know like what's standard and uh they were like no yeah like like oh like over like like 13 or 1500 whatever they said people uh came through and I'm like, oh my God, that's a lot of people. I didn't know, but I didn't know if their standard was like more or what. Like, and they're like, no, that's a, that literally broke all of our uh, previous records. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay, cool. And, and it was just sort of processing that. But um, yeah, couldn't ask for a better opening night because, uh, uh, like I said, people were just so excited to see this show finally happen. But, um, the fact that it opened up with so much traction obviously means that there's a lot more people going each and every day. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I can't believe that, 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 that happened. And, and the fact that it was, it was like 1700 folks or something like that means that amount of folks felt inclined or interested or in love with my art enough to want to come out and, either meet me or see what the show is all about and uh yeah i mean i'm i'm blessed that people think that uh that uh you know it's 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 to that degree i gotta say bravo my friend because that felt like it felt like i was watching the video and felt like you were like either like a pop, pop star or like the michael mm -hmm. jackson or the beatles or even like if you're going talking about artist work like someone like a Jim Lee or a Scott Snyder or Jeff Johns or Stan Lee or the late yeah. great Stan Lee while he was still while they while he was still alive, like getting right rock star receptions. No, I, I mean you're 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 comparing me to some some of the greats. I, I appreciate it. You know, when I'm in that moment, 
uh they're they're like only one thing matters to me and it's you know meeting as many people as i can because i hate the feeling of like oh i you know somebody wanted to meet me and i just wasn't able to but also like really like outlining to people how much love was was baked into this thing you know um and and letting them them know that i hope they they feel that love you know through through the exhibition so uh and 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 i think i accomplished my goal of, of meeting everybody um, and everybody just had a big smile on their face when they when they walk through the experience. So uh, to me, that's what it's all about. Absolutely, absolutely. So if one so re- second to last question, are you ready? Yes, of course. So I got us to commend you on your social media number. So what ha- how, what are some of the strategies that you and your team worked on to make sure that you have high engagement, high following? Uh, it's gonna sound weird, but it really is just my intuition uh seeing and 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 really gauging as to uh what's working and what's not um you know social media of course moves very fast so what works in one moment or one week may not work the next week um you know it's it's it, you have to keep your finger very close to the pulse of course so um i i also really like to use my own personal judgment about what I find funny or what I find powerful or what I find exciting because very, very, very often if I find something hilarious or I find something uh, super touching, um, very often the audience will feel the same way. Um, And so I've tried to, uh, uh, you know, of course, listen to my own gut. And uh, at the end of the day, it is art. So if the artist doesn't believe in it, you know, what's the point? But um, yeah, just really keep trying to, uh, uh, you know, post stuff that you're genuinely feeling, but also, you know, not being afraid to experiment and try something new. I think a lot of folks online, you know, unfortunately fall into a little bit of a stagnant pattern and they get locked into something that is just very like copy and paste and, and, and the creator gets pretty bored of it and they burn out but if you keep pushing the envelope and you see you know there's always new stuff to be discovered out there every time that i did that it's it's been it's it's resonated with the audience uh, super well and um yeah, I'm, I'm constantly reminded that uh, i have to keep experimenting if if this thing should you know can can keep living on so uh, uh i would say it's it's those two things um, obviously it's, it's all the boring words like, you know, scheduling and consti- consistency and, uh, you know, whatever. But, uh, uh, I think the, the true core of it is, is not being afraid to experiment and, um, you know, really listening to your gut about what you think is exciting to put out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So final question. Are you ready? Yes. If, if our audience, if any of my audience members can't make it to K11 Shanghai, who want to see your artwork or connect with you, where can they find you on social media and where can they find your artwork? Yeah, great question. So of course on social media, I'm just about uh, everywhere, either as Cool Man Coffee Dan or Danny Casal. Um, if you want to experience my my vast digital world, uh, my physical artwork right now, the only place it's located is in Shanghai, but uh, there's always galleries that pop up around uh, America uh, that I usually post ra- about on my social media. So if you're unable to get to Shanghai, um, I will be posting uh, a little bit of a, a personal walkthrough to give a, a tour, you know, to my followers on Instagram and whatnot. Um, so that'll be going up very soon if you can't make it over there. But uh, uh, yeah, many more shows, whether it's a fully immersive experience like a K11 um, or more traditional gallery shows with my physical works. Uh, coming soon and I always talk about it um, on my social media platforms awesome awesome so guys have you listened to an episode of the Jake's Take with Jake and Valley Sharp podcast well if you have you can catch up all on all of our episodes on Apple Podcasts Deezer Google Podcasts iHeartRadio, Radio Podcast Addict Spotify and Speaker it's just Jake and Valley Jake's Take with Jake and Valley Sharp J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R now are you on social media because I'm on social media too Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Twitter, and YouTube. 
or should I said X as of this record? <laughs> Jacob Ahar, J A C O B E L Y A C H A R. Now, guys, if you just to let you know, jakesake.com, jakesashake.com is celebrating its 12th anniversary in uh, this August. So, if you want to find out my interview, more interviews, more music reviews, what's going on with this season of America's Got Talent, and if you missed the last episode, last episode of The Mad Singer, head over to jakesashake.com. Danny, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with me today. I am really appreciate it. And congratulations with all your success. Thank you so much, Jacob. I appreciate you having me on. You're so welcome, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, have a great one, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye.